Welcome to the Loins of History, and this week Jay and I decided to take a bit of an uncontroversial subject and discuss it, the Second Amendment. And all kidding aside, <laughs> we, we want to take a look at the current laws, cases, and events and discuss if they have any impact on our Second Amendment rights. So first, let's read what the Constitution actually says in the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Boom. That's it. Boom. There it is. Episode over. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So first, Jay and I are going to start off by talking about a a court case, actually, uh, Heller versus DC. And Jay, can you give us a little bit of background on this case, and then we dive into what some of the justice opinions were. Yeah, absolutely. So we we picked this case because it was fairly recent. I think it was 2008. But it also really succinctly explains what exactly the Second Amendment protects, because there's a lot of controversy here. And frankly, there's a lot of commas <laughs> in this amendment that are like, Which why turn is- out to be very important. <laughs> right. The grammar is not um, readily apparent to modern day readers like, wait a minute. Uh, that's probably more the fault of our public school system, but we digress. <laughs> that's, a, that's another, that's another, uh, that's another, another episode. episode. Hey, so Heller DC. So Heller was a gentleman that lived in the District of Columbia. He was a, a law enforcement officer. And at the time, D.C. required its uh, residents to submit a request for a temporary permit to maintain a firearm. It was legal. It's legal in D- at this time, you know, before the decision, it was legal to own a firearm. It was just heavily regulated. And you basically had to ask the D.C. government for permission to own a firearm in your house. Well, Heller was a was a police officer. He wanted to maintain a firearm when he was off duty. So he submitted a request to get a year long uh, permit to maintain a firearm in his home. And it was denied. So Heller sued D.C. saying that they were restricting his uh, Second Amendment rights. And long story short, the Supreme Court got the case and in a five to four ruling ruled that the D.C. uh, laws were in violation of the Second Amendment. But uh, Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion and he basically said the Second Amendment pertains to individuals as well as the militia. Okay, so uh, Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And in that opinion, he said that the Second Amendment applies to individuals as well as to you know keeping a well-regulated militia. Whereas Justice uh, Breyer, who wrote one of the dissenting opinions, wrote that the Second Amendment is primarily concerned with um, service in the militia in that it does not give citizens an unlimited right to bear arms detached from uh, militia service. So essentially, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision ruled that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to maintain a firearm. So Jay, let's take a look at some of these key phrases. And I in Scalia's opinion for right now, one of the things I think he really did a great job of explaining was the right of the people. And I'm going to quote him here. The first salient feature of the operative clause is that it codifies a right of the people. The unamended constitution and the bill of rights uses the phrase right of the people two other times in the first amendments assembly and petition clause and in the fourth amendments search and seizure clause the ninth amendment uses very similar terminology the enumeration of the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people all three of these instances unambiguously refer to individual rights not collective rights or rights that may be exercised only through participation in some corporate body, i.e. a militia. And I think that's important to note because 
a lot of the talking points today when we talk about a restriction on the Second Amendment is based on the um, well-regulated militia. And a lot of critics of the Second Amendment and people who um, are really anti-gun rights, they claim that you have to be part of this militia and it needs to be well-regulated by a government body. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's actually even in Justice Stevens' opinion that he makes this argument uh, when in fact – as Scalia points out, you don't have to participate in this corporate body of a militia, a well-regulated one at that, in order to have the right to bear arms. I actually – I want to read what J- James Madison, the first version of his – of the Bill of Rights, what he wrote as the first version of the Second Amendment because I think it's enlightening – when when folks try to claim like, oh, it's only in keeping a well-regulated militia, they're actually appealing to what the founders understood the Second Amendment to be, right? Therefore, if if it can be shown that the founders actually had individual rights here, in addition to the keeping of a militia, then the argument kind of falls flat on its face. So let's – this is James Madison's first version of the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. (laughs) Semicolon. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. Colon. But no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. So there's actually three things there. That last part ended up getting nixed prior to you know the final iteration. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on it. It was essentially like you can't force people who have a, a religious reason to not participate in the militia to participate in the militia and keep a firearm. But the first version of this Bill of Rights, like it's very clear that the guy who wrote the Constitution, <laughs> James Madison, uh, literally the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not so, be infringed. And I also want to make it first <laughs> off, very it's very clear. But I also want to say when you said semicolon, a semicolon is used to link two independent clauses that are similar, but they're independent. Right. So it's not – it's not like one is dependent on the other. So when I say, you know, semicolon, something else is related, but not, you know, I don't have to have one in order to have the other, which is important to remember. And then I think Scalia right. makes that point is, well, no, this is a right to the people, not a people who comprise the militia. It's unfortunate that there's an attempt to tie the right to bear arms to only service in the militia. It's kind of a very thinly veiled attempt to just out and out claim that individuals don't have a right to to bear arms because the militia is essentially uh, defunct. It there are states that maintain a militia. The South Carolina one being you, one of my favorites, <laughs> the greatest state in the union. Can you? But, imagine, well, can you imagine? Yeah. Let's, let's just kind of let's take that and run with it. Can you imagine? The argument for, you know, the gun control advocates, if you said, okay, we're going to have a well-regulated militia, then everybody who wants to be part of it, come join. It would be the very people who they don't want to have guns and the people who they are, they would be really upset if those people just said, hey, we're going to form a militia and we're going to train. Cause yeah. guess, and guess what? A lot of them, a lot of it is like... <laughs> is the John Boy and Billies of the world that we referred to a while yeah. ago. But you know what? A lot of them would be would have military training. Probably a lot of former military would join. Yeah. So it could be very well regulated yeah. and it would be in red states. So a lot. I mean, I think this, they, right. people were upset that DeSantis was forming like his own Florida National Guard. And it's like 400 to 1,200 people, I think. And they were upset about it. Yeah. Can you imagine if they did that at scale and just said, okay, well, you have to be in the rail – it's a silly argument. Well, exactly. It's militia. a silly argument that I think they just throw out, like you said, to try and restrict a liberty. Mm-hmm. And that's another point I want to make real quick. I think it is in Scalia's opinion that he says that this is not a right given by the Constitution, actually. It is a, it is a natural mm. right that the Second Amendment just mm. expounds upon. It just writes it into law. But it is right. a right that we all have as as um, 
from the creator, as we've talked about in like every series about natural law. So again, we're not even appealing to the constitution. We're going beyond that. The constitution is just the writing um, specific to American citizens. So Jay, I think it's important to understand that when we talk about this natural law, if the constitution didn't exist and we were just people existing like we did 10,000 years ago or whatever, mm-hmm. we would be defending ourselves that would not even be a question. Yeah. It's a matter of survival. And I think that is when we talk about an inalienable right, it is something we have evolved into. We are not the strongest. We are the apex predators. We're not the strongest. Our whole survival has been dependent on our ability to defend ourselves and finding means to do it. So right. if you're going to say, I am going to give up a right to defend myself, it has to be something you consent to through legal means, i.e. checks and balances, going through the legislative, signed by the executive, ruled on by the judiciary, and there's protections built into it. So I I just want to make the point that I think it's, it's important to understand that we have been doing this for a long time without the Constitution. The Constitution is just designed to protect a right that already exists. Right. Yeah. And in Justice Scalia talks about that that the right to bear arms as a natural right in in his Heller versus DC opinion. So Jay, so we talked about defending ourselves as individuals. What are we defending ourselves against? The days of defending ourselves against predators or just a, a rogue mm-hmm. tribe or something like that from coming into our village is gone. So what are we defending ourselves against now? Yeah. We talked in our last episode about how our natural rights are checked by the common good, right? And I truly believe our an, an individual citizen's right to bear arms is actually more conducive, more productive, more conducive to the common good than just blanket removing it from everybody or heavily regulating it so that only a few citizens in specific circumstances can have it. Like it's actually a really good thing for individuals to have the right to bear arms. And this, with that in mind, that helps understand why the second amendment is even in the bill of rights. Like Madison said in his first version of the second amendment, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. Uh, That just goes to show like our founders believed that when a body of armed disciplined, which is what well-regulated means, uh, disciplined legal citizens is actually the best, or as the actual second amendment says is necessary to a uh, a free country, that's why we have bare arms. Like it's actually towards the common good here. So with that with that being said, there's a few specific reasons why. Like specifically, how does the Second Amendment contribute to uh, the common good? The first reason why the Second Amendment is in the is in the constitution is obviously because it's specifically in there is to protect the existence of, of the militia. Now the militia used to form several very important functions that are less important now, but still have a function. I think it would be a misunderstanding for our listeners to think that the militia no longer exists. It totally still exists legally in quite a few States, but it was a much bigger deal back in the you know 17 1800s than it is now but one of those things that the militia used to do is to actually suppress insurrections <laughs> well, like Shays rebellion yeah you know if if we can remember back to our very first episode like one of the whole impetuses behind forming the constitution after the articles of confederation was that the government didn't have an ability to to basic to suppress insurrections uh to peace and order in society was important. And sometimes there are criminals who, for whatever reason, want to disturb that. And the government needs, like we want the government to have the ability to suppress that. And the way in which that was done was the militia 
there would be a call, hey, come to the mustering grounds and bring your muskets. Like, <laughs> I can't imagine that now. The militia also formed a key role in repelling foreign invasions. Uh, you know, if we recall back to, you know, a few short decades after the constitution was ratified, not even decades, like a decade and a half, uh, you know, the British invaded from Canada, uh, which is a thing. Ne- hashtag never forget. <laughs> <It's> Canadians <laughs> come back. Yeah, you know, I, I want to read a quote by George Mason about who the militia actually is. And this is his address to Virginia ratify, the Virginia Ratifying Convention on June 4th, 1788. I ask, who are the militia? They consist now of the whole people, except for a few public officers. I think it's pretty clear there that the founders, like Scalia said, believed that the militia was a the whole people. And it anybody could join it. It was the whole people. And it was not just... Um, a few well-trained soldiers that a lot of people like to think about now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last reason why the second amendment is in the constitution, and this is, this is very important. And I think this is one aspect that my friends on the left tend to either forget or not be aware of. And that is the founders absolutely had in mind when they ratified the bill of rights, when they were forming the bill of rights, was to protect individual citizens against tyrannical governments. And there are countless quotes from founders all the way up to present day about our ability to bear arms against tyranny. But here's a, here's a few that I think encapsulate the reason we have the Second Amendment. So this is from Benjamin Franklin. They that give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Then this is from George Mason again. To disarm the people is the most effectual way to enslave them. Mm. Before, and this is from Noah Webster um, in an examination of the leading principles of the federal constitution in 1787. Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed. As they are in almost every country in Europe, the supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops. Right. I think that kind of shows you what the attitude was that we've talked about this before. The founders were incredibly leery of tyranny. They just came from, you know, we just broke away from England and Jay, I think you were going to talk a little bit about the English, um, yeah, the English Constitution and some of their rights, because Scalia makes reference to that, and he right. draws upon historical context to make his case for protection of the Second Amendment. And I think it's pretty easy to see what the founders thought. So, Jay, I'll turn it over to you. To- yeah, it's we haven't talked about this yet in our series on the Constitution and American political foundations, but the founders, one of the main influences on the founders in the Constitution was the English Civil War. And in a nutshell, the English Civil War was a conflict between the pro-Catholic monarchs and the Protestant parliamentarians. And you can even kind of see there, there's a religious aspect and then there's a political aspect to this. The, The reason why the Protestants were parliamentarians was the, uh, the monarchy, you know, the monarchy was Catholic essentially. And there was this, you know, back then it was way more common for the state to enforce a specific religion on the people And the majority of uh, English citizens at that time were not Catholic. They were Protestant, but the ruling class, the monarchy were still Catholics. And this all kind of came to a head, you know, Oliver Cromwell, who was a Protestant, kind of led the parliamentarians. They won the Civil War. He got in power. But then they were like, eh, we still like the monarchy. And then they had the Glorious Revolution and brought in uh, William and Mary. But long story short, what came out of this English Civil War was this Bill of Rights in 1689. And one of the main things that's in this Bill of Rights is guaranteeing the right of English citizens to to keep and bear arms. Uh, They wanted this right in there because one of the main things the Catholic monarchy was doing was trying to remove this right (laughs) from the people 
in the parliamentarians, uh, which y- you can kind of see here, a parliamentary form of government is similar to a House of Representatives and a Senate in that it's 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 democracy. It's not monarchy, right? So you had the the democratic Protestants and the authoritarian monarchist uh, Catholics, and they were trying to remove the people's right to bear arms. So in this uh, Bill of Rights in 1689, they they kept that in there to make, make sure that um, English citizens could still keep arms. And when our founders were forming their Bill of Rights, like they literally, you know, in our words, copied and pasted a lot of stuff <laughs> from the, from the uh, English Bill of Rights this being one of them. So it actually might be worth mm-hmm. worthwhile just kind of reading the context in the English Bill of Rights where uh, where it grants this ability for citizens to keep and bear arms. So this is this is from the the English Bill of Rights. Whereas the late King James the 2nd I almost want to read this in anything. Whereas the late King James the 2nd by the assistance <laughs> So this is the English Bill of Rights. <clears throat> Whereas the late King James. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, I love, I love Brits. Anyway. <laughs> Whereas the late King James II, by the assistance of diverse evil counselors, judges, and ministers employed by him, did endeavor to subvert and extirpate the Protestant religion and laws and liberty of this kingdom, list of grievances including, by causing several good subjects being Protestants to be disarmed at the same time when papists were both armed and employed contrary to law, thereupon the said lords spiritual and temporal and commons pursuant to their respective letters and elections being now assembled in a full and free representative of this nation, taking into their most serious consideration the best means for attaining the ends aforesaid due in the first place for the vindicating and asserting their ancient rights and liberties, (laughs) declare that the subjects... (laughs) That the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions, and as allowed by law. I really wanted to read that in an English accent. (laughs) Sounds like you got a tickle in your throat halfway through there. That's a long way of saying that the government doesn't have a right to take one people's guns away. You know, once one group of people's right basically infringe on their rights to bear arms, and they can't do it. It's a very eloquent way to say it, but yeah. So Jay, I think we've I think we've pretty much covered everything as to why the Second Amendment is actually in the Constitution. Yeah. As Scalia said, it was we've talked about this is a natural right that humans have been doing and would do in nature because it is a right bestowed upon by the Creator. It has roots in the Eng- from the English Civil War that our founders drew upon to create a law or an amendment and put it in the Bill of Rights to protect against in our constitution. And it exists as an individual right given to the whole people, right? Not just the militia as Scalia fantastic opinion as he, he wrote through in the Heller versus DC case, Mm -hmm. fantastic opinion. And it is for us to not only defend ourselves as individuals, but defend ourselves from tyranny. So you can see a lot of the founders had said, not only in the Constitution, but afterward when they were remarking and um, discussing the Constitution, why it is important. It is so. With all of that being said, let's fast forward to today's time. Hot topic. There's been mass shootings, there's mm. carry laws, there's red flag laws, there's essentially a divide between both sides of the political spectrum, on, and it falls along party lines essentially of what we think about gun control right everyone likes to talk common sense gun control without actually any meaning to it so jay mass shootings i think there's two different examples that we can use to kind of compare and contrast a proper use of the second amendment and Mm -hmm. how forfeiting that right may cost lives so right we're going to talk about the uvalde shooting and then eli dickens 
Jay, I'll let you talk yeah. a little bit about about that real quick. Yeah. I mean, first I want to address like the emotional reason for most gun control advocates for wanting to restrict, you know, citizens' right to bear arms. Cause it is it is worthwhile. I think it's it's important that we try to understand one another here. <laughs> and I'm also a big believer in the fact that human beings don't come to conclusions and beliefs through rational analysis. <laughs> they come to we come to conclusions based on emotion. Uh and that's that's everyone, by the way. Uh I'm sure if somebody wants to debate me on that, please uh comment. We love I think comments. the science will, will prove you're correct. <laughs> yeah, there's tons of studies. Anyway, the uh the point being here is that the emotional reason is something like Uvalde, right? And I and I don't want to dismiss that. Like children died. Like that's horrible. The it and it's very important for both for the right to keep this in mind here is that there are people in this country who time and time and time again have you have abused their second amendment right to commit some of the most heinous acts that that we can possibly imagine the you know killing the senseless killing of children it it's not something that we can just uh you know say oh i've got a second amendment right case closed you, like you're right you can't you can't immediately just like we think that people are exploiting the emotion you can't just dismiss it immediately right. and say well it, both sides jump to a political, uh, they get entrenched. You can't, just like you can't be controlled by your emotions, you can't also just straight up dismiss them and negate the fact that a lot of people are hurting right now because of that shooting. Yeah. So when we, you know, when we talk about the common good here, essentially up front, the argument that I want to make is that the best way to prevent people abusing the second amendment is through the proper use of the second amendment, not the outright like repeal, which I know very few people are advocating for, uh, but some people are advocating for it, uh, nor overly and unconstitutionally regulating legal or law abiding citizens use of the second amendment. And this is why we wanted to talk about Eli Dickens was for Uvalde, we just saw this is what happens when we give to the government our right to self-defense. Hey, we want the government. We call 911, which again, I'm not, I'm actually very pro police <laughs> in a very lot of ways. Like I, it's, yeah, I just want to say it up front. Huge fan, huge supporter of police. Yes, uh, you know, there's problems. Uvalde <laughs> that we're about to talk about is a huge one, is a big one of them. And that's kind of the thing. Like when we give up this right to the government, the government will do it, but they are extremely inefficient <laughs> oh <my laughs> to gosh. put it <laughs> to put it lightly in in performing that role. And Uvalde is like the textbook example of that. Go ahead, Colin. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, a lot of people in the the aftermath of really any shooting, they they have this somebody do something kind of immediate reaction. And it's, okay, if you want that somebody to be the government, you need to understand exactly what you're going to get yourself into. Well, Uvalde is a perfect example of that. If you want the government to protect you and to be responsible, the sole you know, the sole protector of you, you need to understand mm -hmm. what you're going to get into. And yeah. there are massive levels of failure of uh, failures of incompetence. If you look into right now, I think they just suspended without pay. The principal they're look, I think they've, the, the police chief is under an incredible amount. The entire police force is under incredible amount mm -hmm. of scrutiny, because if you look at the timeline, you watch the videos there are so many different points at which that shooting could have been stopped by government employees yeah. and it didn't happen. It right. wasn't until what, like an hour and a half into the shooting or something yeah. like that. And like, you know, the, at this point, children had been killed when somebody who was across the street getting a haircut grabbed a shotgun 
and went over there and stopped the shooter. And wow. that story may have been exaggerated a little bit, but you know, it's kind of this hero's thing. But you've got these government this government employees, the police, who were basically just they were so the bureaucracy was so ingrained in them. You know, one mm-hmm. police officer made a call. I think oh, there's a gunman. Should I take them down? They didn't get a response. You know what was probably happening in the background? That whoever he was talking to on the radio was too scared to make a decision. Yeah. Well, I got to call my boss. I got to call my boss. And that's how the government works. Yeah. Or you had all these police that were inside the building. They're like, well, we got a procedure dictates that we do it this way. And then they, they just didn't take action. They were with, they were holding parents back from getting in. Yeah. And you look at it and that's, that's what you need to understand. If you're going to give up your right to defend yourself, that's, what's going to be defending you. And it's not right. always the best. Right. And this is in contrast to Eli Dickens, right? Who this is, this is a, a, a crazy story here, but long story short, Eli Dickens was using his newly enshrined right to, uh, to carry a firearm in a, a shopping mall food court where a active shooter just shows up in this shoot court or in this food court and starts shooting people. He had killed like three people where Eli Dickens from 40 yards basically takes this guy down with his, with his firearm in 15 seconds. Landed eight out of 10 shots at 40 yards. If you don't know, if you don't know anything about firearms, that's really good to hit. Yeah. Eight out of 10 at 40 yards on a moving target that has a weapon. That's incredible. It, yeah, it's insane. Uh, <laughs> It's very, very crazy to, you know, Even the, to do that in a simulated environment. And this thing about all the adrenaline that had to be going. The, but the point is, is like, and this guy's what, in his 20s? He's like kind of early 20s too? Like 22 or something like that. Yeah. Like, this is, and there's, there's countless stories of this where active shooters have been stopped by an individual citizen who was armed, Right. I mean, there's other story or there's other examples of active shooters being stopped by the police, which is good and great. Like, but this just goes to show you like the best way to prevent someone abusing the second amendment is through the proper use of the second amendment. It's, it's about defense. The, the people who have a strong view of the second amendment are not trying to protect criminals ability to go and commit crimes, right? It's about law-abiding citizens defending themselves and other people. I should say that that it's not that the police can't or won't protect you. It's that yeah. they shouldn't be the only protection against Correct. you. Correct. So for mass shootings here, like I, I do kind of want to look at this from the left's perspective here because there's also a lot of good research and data that shows if these individuals who ultimately commit a quote unquote mass shooting, if they didn't have access to firearms, it's highly likely that the mass shooting would not have occurred. Therefore, the emotional reason is like, we need to take firearms out of these people's hands prior to them actually committing the crime, as opposed to waiting after the mass shooting has already occurred, which then kind of is pointless right like the mass the the crime has already occurred like people are already dead which it makes sense and i think that's important for our for our listeners on the right to keep in mind is like average citizens who are in favor of gun control regulation they are not they're not usually sitting bureaucrats in government who are trying to figure out the best way to become a tyranny like that's not what's in their head (laughs) They're not sitting there going like, I real, I want to be tyrannical. <laughs> That's not what's going on. Now, there might be there might be certain politicians or certain, you know, people who are running for office primarily, uh, who, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally <laughs> are trying to to create a a society that is more authoritarian in nature. But, you know, that's just that's just simply not the emotional reason by most people on the left in favor of gun control regulation. You know, we're talking about some of these 
carry laws, you know, there's a difference between concealed carry, open carry. Um, some states are really pushing hard on the open carry and mm-hmm. some states have more lenient concealed carry. Um, then there's the red flag laws and, you know, talking about could another law have prevented a Uvalde, let's say, do you think that if there was another law in place that the Uvalde shooter would have been stopped? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know it's, I'm it's, not familiar uh, with Texas it's a, laws. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thought exercise. Well, so here is an example of where the law, another law wouldn't have worked, but the laws that already exist might mm-hmm. have stopped somebody. And it's really, it becomes a matter more of enforcing what's really on the books right now instead of just enacting another gun law. Because I think it's important to understand that most people that are affected by your average gun laws are going to be law-abiding citizens. People that have committed heinous crimes in the past and aren't able to own a firearm, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're the ones that are going to figure out a way to get one. And there's an example of um, Devin Patrick Kelly in, I think, 2017 in Texas, opened fire at a church and killed um, – he killed a couple people, and he was actually shot and chased by two men, two armed citizens, because uh, the police never got there, and he, he ended up fleeing. And they, you know, they they got a hold of him, and they they were able to kill him. Mm-hmm. The he was discharged from the air force for committing a felony. I think it was felony rape, mm-hmm. and that should have been reported to the national crime information center database, which would have prevented him from buying the firearm that he committed the act with. And actually recently there was a judge that held the air force liable because they didn't abide by Pentagon rules. Now Pentagon rules, is it a law? Is it enforceable? Mm -hmm. They're held liable. There's a lot of different legal debate there, but the point is there were rules already in place. There was a law that would have prevented him from buying that weapon. It was just a bureaucratic failure so the, the government, which we're asking to do a better job of preventing these, failed in laws that already existed in preventing a mass shooting. Would another of law have stopped that? Well, no, because they failed to enforce the ones, the rules and laws that they already had in place. So yeah. I, te- I tend to believe that an additional law wouldn't stop a shooter. It's just, it's just not there. We have plenty of laws. Yeah. And if you look at the United States crime statistics and where gun crime is most prevalent, it is in cities that have the strictest gun laws. You know, We hear about Chicago yeah. all the time, St. Yeah. Louis, Baltimore, very dangerous, very pro-gun um, control. Yeah. I, this, is, this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about political grandstanding. <laughs> The, I think um, I'll do that right now. No, so I think it's it's important for people to understand that on both sides, and the gun control Second Amendment debate is one of the main ones that a great way to make a lot of money is to partic- is to take a particular issue talk about how you're going to change everything regarding this particular issue if people only gave you money to help you get elected or something like that. And it's a perpetual cycle. Right. Or, yeah, give money to your particular PAC or think tank or, you know, it's not just political candidates. It's organiz- Yeah, it's it's organizations, right? I don't want to name names. I don't want to name organizations here. <laughs> But it's just something to keep in mind that whether it's pro Second Amendment or gun control oriented, it's on both sides that these people will generate hysteria. Either they're killing our baby, they're killing our children, we've got to stop this, or they're trying to take all of our guns away. If you only donate $20 a year to my organization, <laughs> always, Every like email. it's. If you haven't noticed, no, again, both sides. If you haven't noticed, especially in the, I've noticed this, especially in Congress and we're getting off the second amendment a little bit, but we'll, we'll bring it back to it. If you notice, so like when actually, you know what this, this does. So the Supreme court had a couple big decisions 
previously overturning Roe versus Wade, there's actually a, a decision that um, speaking of the Second Amendment about New York's concealed carry. Both of those are hot top, hot political topics: mm-hmm. abortion, Second Amendment. Well, for a long time, um, le- the legislative body, like you said, has been relying on the judiciary in order to basically do their dirty work. So yeah. the legis- so Congress could walk away and say, "Hey, you know what? I'm doing my, f- I'm fighting for you. I'm doing this." When they're really just relying on the ignorance of the American people as to how the how government actually works, you know, the legislative, especially, you know, in Congress, they really rely on people not understanding that the Supreme court doesn't make laws. They're just ruling on laws that already exist. And so I saw a lot of politicians sending out emails about work, you know, they're, they're taking away women's reproductive rights. And I see other politicians saying they're going for your second amendment rights. They're going to pack the court, things like that. Well, Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Contact, or uh, Mr. and Mrs. Congressman, or Congressperson, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's your job to pass the law. Why don't yeah. you do that? I, as a citizen, am the check against tyranny right now, and you are not doing your job. Instead of my twenty dollars, how about my vote for you to do something in my interest? You know, why don't you legislate rather than trying to quote fight the judiciary? fight the fight the fighting right. is legislating bills stop throwing your mark you know stop throwing all this fluff and pork onto bills so they don't pass or they die why don't you just pass a simple bill if you want yeah. the, if you want this to be a law pass a one-page bill that says this is a law it's not that difficult stop mm-hmm. utilizing the judiciary as your scapegoat in order for you to raise money long tangent to say that the second amendment abortion a lot of these other political um hot button issues are being utilized by your politicians in order to generate money. Right. Don't let them do it. And also keep lobbyists out of it because lobbyists don't donate to lobby groups. Don't donate to these massive organizations because they do the same thing. And then mm-hmm. they have lots of money and they'll go in and they'll pay your politician money to do something to counteract your vote. Yeah. I hate to say it, but oof. yeah. So no so I'm saying a lot of things there. Yeah. So Political grandstanding is absolutely a thing, and the Second Amendment and gun control is one of the main things to grandstand about because there's a lot of money to be made in political grandstanding. The The last thing I'll say is I'll use a personal example. I have a, a relative uh, that was killed by a drunk driver when he was 16 years old. He was riding a bicycle, and a drunk driver hit him, killed him. Would the proper response of my family at that time to say, we need to ban alcohol (laughs) because Lord knows how many crimes take place under the influence of just alcohol. Not even talking about drugs here, just alcohol. Yeah. Like would a significant amount of crime be completely eliminated if nobody drank alcohol in the United States? Absolutely. Yes. But why should, but here's the point I'm trying to make. It's already illegal to drive drunk. There's all, it's already a heavily regulated thing, right? It doesn't make any sense to try to go one step further and go, you know what? No alcohol, none. Or, you know, a very common argument is to say like more people die in car accidents by far. We should nobody be allowed to drive. Like that's not the society. I, I feel like we say this almost every episode. That's not the society that we want to live in. But that was a very real reality for my family. It's like they lost a loved one due to somebody breaking the law there. But I truly believe the, the proper response is not to create more laws, just that other people will continue to break. <laughs> And the reason why I bring it up is like, again, like I understand the emotional, you know, if somebody has a family member that was killed by a, by an active shooter, a completely senseless, random, you know, act of violence that is heartbreaking. It's terrifying. Like, like completely understand, but we've got to understand here that our natural rights, our natural rights are checked by the common good. And we do not want to create more laws that will infringe upon the common good. More legislation is not the answer. It's actually the proper use of the current legislation 
that is the answer. And, you know, right now there's some legislation that actually just got passed with these red flag laws. You know, the only issue I take with red flag laws is the potential for a due process violation. You know, essentially a red flag law is that if somebody is deemed a threat to themselves or a threat to others by a competent authority, they can have their weapons confiscated. The problem is this is open to abuse, especially of your, you know, your due process rights in that you may not have the ability to defend yourself and come before and say, Hey, um, by the way, I'm not, here's all the proof that I'm, I'm okay. I'm not, I don't have a problem. You need to hear my side of the story. Right. You know, you could get somebody who is angry, downright lies or distorts some evidence and comes forward and says, Hey judge, here's all this evidence that this person is a threat to others you need to come in and take all their all their weapons well did you listen to the person you know did that person have a right to defend themselves or are you just going to potentially take away their guns for a week a year a month who knows so that's what's really disconcerting it's it's the lack of due process right that that should absolutely be a concern because i think when we look at Red flag laws, which just to explain real quick what a red flag law is, is it allows a judge, right, to receive a hearing either from law enforcement officers or directly from family members, depending on the states, which, and just for the record, no, there's no such thing as two red flag laws that are the exact same. There's, I think, 17 states that currently have some form of a red flag law plus the District of Columbia. Yep. Um so they're all different, but generally speaking, it allows either law enforcement or a you know a family member, a citizen, etc., to approach a judge, and the judge can issue a I don't I don't know the specific thing, but the judge can essentially temporarily take away someone's firearms uh, under very specific reasons, i.e., they're a threat to themselves or someone else. And, and you know, I look at this and. People are like, oh, well, that might have worked because if you look at a lot of these mass shootings, um, you know, like Uvalde and and some of these other ones, there were there were signs, um, you know, Nicholas Cruz had posted, you know, he's the one in um, in Florida, the Parkland County shooter, Nick Cruz, he, you know, had exhibited signs and I think law enforcement was aware and I think the FBI might have been aware there's there's signs a lot of times that these shooters are and you know that's kind of the basis for these red flag laws is like okay we can intervene before a tragedy occurs uh, again you're relying on a, a government entity that potentially could be incompetent to do their job yeah. um so would a red flag law help potentially if it's enforced correctly you know, had somebody reported to a judge, I think this guy is a danger, is a danger Go in and, you know, search his house, take his weapons, maybe. But that also requires, you know, maybe they should have gone to Nicholas Cruz and have him defend himself as well. I I don't know that I don't have a a definite answer. But, you know, that's the thought process that it could have done, it could have helped prevent this. I don't know if it would have. Right. And, and I think that's okay. We don't have to be able to definitively say this law will definitely prevent X, Y, and Z from occurring. The can't, can't armchair quarterback something that's already happened, right? Um, so just for our listeners, my position on red flag laws are it depends. The I think there's legitimate concerns with red flag laws. Um, it's almost like any law. It kind of depends on who's writing the law is whether or not it concerns me. <laughs> and so I'm a real quick, I I'm a big fan of the heritage foundation. Uh, they are a DC based think tank that is on the conservative side. Um, and a lady named, uh, a lady named Amy swear, who is a legal fellow in their center for legal and judicial studies. She wrote a really good R- uh, FAQ on red flag laws and just specifically on the abuse part of it, and this is from a conservative think tank, mind you. This is this is what she said real quick. The danger of abuse, however, is not unique to red flag laws. 
all laws, including criminal laws, civil commitment laws, and laws allowing for the imposition of restraining orders can be misused or misapplied to harass uh, disfavored groups. The proper solution to the risk of laws being improperly applied is not to avoid laws altogether, but to craft laws narrowly, to afford effective oversight and accountability and provide meaningful remedies in cases of abuse. All of this can be accomplished in a red flag framework. So, hmm. so what she what she's arguing and what I tend to agree with here is that Yes, the danger of abuse is a legitimate concern. Due process is a legitimate concern, and they should absolutely be taken into account in current state laws and in you know states that are considering writing red flag laws. That should absolutely fix that. The answer, though, is not to just not have red flag laws, which could help in a particular instance, the solution is to make them narrow and narrow enough to avoid sweeping reform and blah, 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 blah. So I would just encourage like, there is room for a way forward that could be beneficial to society. I would just encourage, you know, listeners in more left-leaning states, like don't try to, you know, go for gold or hit a home run here and use a red flag law to, legislate all the gun control reforms that you want. Conversely, to our listeners on the right, don't look at red flag laws as the left trying to take all your guns because it's usually a little bit more nuanced than that. And it it does have the potential to provide a mechanism to prevent these shootings. Because like Colin said earlier, Nearly 100% of all these mass shooters, they have all displayed signs of it occurring prior to it occurring. Like there were, there were quote unquote red flags all over the place. Jay, I think you just made me a believer in red flag laws. I was very skeptical at first. <laughs> well, it wasn't me. It was heritage. <laughs> it was heritage. Well, you know, I, I had, you know, I, that was really my big concern. I was like, well, can due process be violated? But in that case, if we do write a red flag law that is narrow, has oversight and a means to rent. And I think that's the biggest thing, a means to correct any issue. Think about the constitution. There is a means to amend it. There's an amendment process. There have been times in history where we said, Hey, we didn't get everything right. We're going to fix it. Yeah. Great. And then we went through and did it. And I think your point about oversight, the, we talked about it, I think in the first episode on the constitution where the people, you know, you said the people themselves are a check well, this is something where if we pay attention to these laws and we are involved and we almost provide our own oversight and say, hey, you know what? I think this this right here, you guys, the legis- you got the legislation wrong. We want you to fix this. We need you to amend this and fix this. I think that's very important. And really all this is is a call for people to be uh, politically active and involved Dude. at the local and state level. Yep. Bingo. Dude, that, I – our minds have melded. Th- that was exactly yeah. where I was going. That was a podcast. <laughs> like, okay, if you actually want to do something about making this a better society, you can get involved. And the easy button is to like tweet something or put it on Facebook and just kind of like talk. It's like, you want to know what's less of what's less effective. You know, people like to say like, my vote doesn't mean anything. You know what really doesn't mean anything? Your social media post. (laughs) So it's like the vote and votes mean something by the way. But it's like, if you really want to do something like do some research into your state that you live in or your country, if you're, you know, not in the United States and go like, Oh, what laws are being into consideration? And is this, you know, if there's a red flag law being, in consideration of my state, what does it actually say? And write your congressman, send them an email, your senator, congresswoman, representative, what member of parliament, like doesn't matter, uh, like contact them and say, hey, I think this is a good idea. I want this. Or, hey, I think this is a bad idea. You, I don't want you to vote for this, etc. That is how democracy functions. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> too too often people get caught up in what is happening at the national level. It is very easy to see it as this bright flashing light and 
it's take all the attention and your ability. If more people just said, Hey, you know what? I'm not going to worry about what happens in, you know, what somebody from Washington state says, I'm just going to worry about my town. I'm Hey, let's make my town a better place. You know, I, I feel like I hear that, you know, think global globally, act locally. Well, there's some, there's some truth to that. If you were to say, Hey, you know what? I really want to make my community better by voting for these people that I think are going to align with my values. And I want to give a little bit more power to them. Guess what? You're going to see incremental change at a national level. You are not going to see a lot of change by donating money to a super PAC that you think is going to give you what you want and influence sure. politicians. They might, That's but they're right. going to have their own agenda. So the way to avoid that is to begin at a grassroots local level. I, me personally, I think that's where you that's where you defend your rights more effectively. That's where right. you get more immediate change. You know, whether it's First Amendment, Second Amendment, any of the amendments, anything yeah. that's happening. Whether you don't like heck, you don't like how your your county spending money. You know what little money they may have. You don't like it. Go to a town hall meeting. Have you have you ever been? I actually have started going to some of my county. Um, like the the, um, the county town hall meetings, it's actually pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and when more people show up, they don't get to do as much and people ask questions and they can't yeah. just like say, hey, I'm just going to do this. People would be like, no, 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 no. I want to go speak about this. And yeah. can pre- I have literally seen with my own eyes them change zone, zoning um, regulations. You know, they wanted to pass some new zoning, uh, you know, update the zoning uh, laws. They didn't get to do it because a bunch of people showed up and were really mad about it. And I say a bunch of people is like 20 people, which is a lot. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. That's my own. No, point. that's a really good point. The, uh, you know, the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot is one of the right wings media's favorite people to hate on. And all I have to say is like, I don't care about Lori Lightfoot. And the reason why I don't care is because I am not a resident of Chicago. <laughs> we you can have opinions, but again, this goes back to the to the political grandstanding point and how that's connected to fundraising. People use Lori Lightfoot and you know, throwing dirt at her to raise money for something that has nothing to do with Chicago. Something that could be happening is not going to take your gun away. And yes. And it's like, I may have an opinion about her, but it's like what happens. This is the beauty of the United States of America. God, I love this country (laughs) is that we have states, we have local governments. And if you want to legislate a certain rule in your part of the country, like knock yourself out get involved in your part of the country and care the most about your specific part. And, you know, if you want to be informed about what's going on, lessons learned, great. But like, I'm not concerned about Chicago gun control laws because I don't live there. (laughs) She's, she, she's given the people what they give the people what they want. She's given the people what they want. And that, yeah, I think that's the thing. Maybe you could look at Chicago and say, "Hey, you know what? I do, I do want that, or I don't want that. I'm going to vote similar. You know, I'm going to vote for someone similar to that or not similar to that in my area. Yeah, that's really the extent of it, and that's yeah. all it has to be. Roundabout way of saying again, get involved in local politics. That's where you're going to see more effective change on gun control. You don't need to be worried about Chicago or, you know, some small town in, I don't know, Kansas." And whatever, or Texas, whatever gun laws they want there, because it's not going to affect you. Let's bring it back to the Second Amendment and kind of close this thing out. Well, Jay, that was uh, that was a heck of an episode. We talked a lot about uh, the Second Amendment, a lot of controversial topics that we talked about, but there's a lot of opinions being thrown around the United States right now, and really internationally. I see a lot of our international friends um, listening into this. Love to hear your opinion on the U.S. and our gun control. Um, opinions and rights and that we have. If I could summarize what Jay and I talked about, it's that we have a natural right. In, we have a right to bear arms that is protected under natural law. That is something that exists whether we have a government or not. It doesn't. It's not derived from the government. 
It's not even derived really from the Constitution. It's derived from the Creator. And the Constitution just enumerates that. It puts it in writing so that we can always go back to it and say, here's this right that we have protected. And we followed it up really with why that law or that bill, that right is protected in the Bill of Rights. And it's in order to protect against tyranny, it's given to individuals as a people. So not it's an individual right that each of us has. It's not specific to a group of people that participates in a militia. It's to protect against tyranny and to protect your own, um, I don't know, yourself, your own individual against a potential threat. We've been doing it for thousands of years, and you have a right to do that, and that's protected under the Second Amendment. I think that's important to understand. You know, then we followed it up with some of the current events that we're facing today and red flag laws and school shootings and or mass shootings, I should say, and um, the way the different methods in which we're protected, whether if we're going to do that exact, completely through the government or uh, if an individual can do that. With all that being said, I just want everyone to, and I want to encourage everyone, whether you're in the U.S. or you're international, to get involved in your your local political scene, whether that's the city, the county, the state, because that's where you're going to affect real change. And that's where you're going to see these rights that you have properly defended. It's not going to be through a super PAC. It's not going to be through some grandstanding politician. It's going to be down the road. It's going to be at these local events, your local politicians. That's where you're going to see the most change. Jay, anything that I, did I miss anything? Uh, that's good. So with all that being said, please give us any feedback you have. Like I said, I'd love to hear from the international audience or Americans, whether you agree, you disagree, you have some other thoughts or questions. Let us know. We'd love to hear it. We'd love to respond. Check us out on social media. We have Twitter handles. We have Instagram now. We'd love to get your uh, love for you to follow us on, on those. We post a few different things related, generally speaking, to the podcast. So sometimes it's just random history. That's fun. And join us next week as we talk about the American political parties. So we've been talking a lot about the Constitution. And if you look at the American political system as it stands today, it's dominated by two parties, Democrats and Republicans. And we want to trace the origins of that and see how we got mm-hmm. here to where we have two parties. I, we were a little critical of the two-party system last week, and we're probably going to be very critical of it again next week. So come check it out as we talk about how we got into the current state of a two-party system as it relates to the American political system. Thank you. Have a great day. 